Today I'm on the Bakerloo line, looking at what must be one of the more unassuming stations around here, Regent's Park. It's one of the smaller stations in central London, and one of the lesser used. It has no interchange with any other line, and it has no service building, just a subway entrance. Well, actually that's not strictly true, but no, I'm getting ahead of myself there. The thing about Regent's Park is that, originally, it wasn't supposed to exist. Let me explain. In 1890, the first deep-level underground railway opened in London. This was the City and South London Railway. It wasn't a massive financial success in itself, but it was nevertheless revolutionary. It was electrically powered, it ran far below the city streets, and importantly, it ran through central London. Railways through London had been all but forbidden since the 1840s. But railways under London were just fine. So, people jumped onto the bandwagon, got in on the ground floor, and participated in all sorts of other metaphors to come up with tube lines of their own. As early as 1891, a railway was proposed called the Baker Street and Waterloo Railway. Legend has it that the businessmen behind it wanted a quick way of getting from Westminster to the cricket grounds at Lord's. Well, perhaps. But what is for sure is that the line would offer a speedy way from north to south, providing connections between a number of railway termini and serving the lucrative West End. There were plenty of buses, but the roads were even more clogged with traffic than they are now. But there were objectors. The Metropolitan Railway were not fans. In theory, because they thought it could potentially block their own extension. But I suspect another aspect was that they had only recently completed the Circle Line, or Inner Circle as it was known then, and they feared that a new, faster tube line would swipe their passengers. In fact, their solicitor described the Bakerloo as absolutely and totally useless, useless and stupid, an omnibus service, and said that it could not possibly be made to pay. Those are all direct quotes, by the way. The South Eastern Railway also objected for much the same reasons. Sir Edward Watkin was chairman of both railways and in fact envisaged connecting the two together. Despite the mighty Edward Watkin's fury, the line was approved. But where Emperor Watkin failed, Queen Victoria succeeded. Or rather, her estate did. The Crown Estate and the Portland Estate, which is very much related to Great Portland Street, by the way, objected to stations being built on their land. So the Parliamentary Joint Committee that had been set up to discuss the various underground bills determined that the new railway should be absolutely forbidden from building any station between Oxford Circus and Baker Street. Fair enough, said the Baker Street and Waterloo Railway chaps. Let's just say the BS and WR from now on. Fair enough, they said. And with approval being given in 1893, they set about raising money. Money proved hard to come by until they were bought out by the London and Globe Finance Corporation, headed by the extraordinarily shady businessman Whitaker Wright. So construction could begin. Progress was good at first. But in 1900, things started falling apart. London and Globe were not paying out the dividends they had promised. Some of the companies it had shares in were collapsing, in fact. Share prices were falling. There was even an absurd rumour that a Chicago businessman named Charles Tyson Yerkes had bought the company. Liquidation proceedings were begun, and those in charge started pointing the finger of blame at each other. And shareholders demanded answers. It transpired that in fact Wright had been selling shares between his own companies to artificially inflate their prices. That is an oversimplification, but that's basically what happened. It is extremely fraudulent. That was the end of London and Globe, and it would be the end of Whitaker Wright. He would take his own life while awaiting trial. So, the BS and WR was up the proverbial creek without a paddle. They had a part-built railway and no money to finish it. Remember how I mentioned the false rumour that Charles Tyson Yerkes had bought the company? Well, what happened next was that Charles Tyson Yerkes bought the company, in 1902. Yerkes was every bit as shady as Wright, but he was rather more stylish and had the advantage of actually knowing how to build a railway. 
What does all this wheeler dealing have to do with Regent's Park Station, you windbag? demanded the impatient viewer. Well, with the ambitious Yerkes at the helm, work could continue. His motto was, buy up old junk, fix it up a little, and offload it on some other fellow. Part of his fixing up process for the failing BS and WR was to put a bill in Parliament for more capital and permission to build three new stations. These were Lambeth North, Edgware Road, and finally, Regent's Park. Perhaps surprisingly, no objections were raised to these three stations, and the bill received royal assent. Sadly for Yerkes, he wouldn't live to see his line completed. He died in 1905. The BS and WR, including Regent's Park, opened on the 10th of March 1906. The press didn't like saying Baker Street and Waterloo Railway any more than I do, and the line soon gained the nickname of the Bakerloo Railway, which would eventually become semi-official and then actually official. The station was pretty basic, at least on the surface. Unlike the other two new stations, Regent's Park would not have an imposing red frontage. Perhaps this was because it was a late edition, or perhaps it was to keep the landowners happy. The ticket office would be built below the surface, although the interior would be every bit as fancy as the other Yerkes owned stations. Now, there was no grand frontage, but that's not to say that there was no surface building. From the opposite side of the road, you can see that there are two sort of neoclassical follies in the gardens of Park Crescent. These are actually ventilation shafts for the tube. Unfortunately, the gardens are private and locked, so this is about the best view you can get. Well, unless you live on the Crescent. Do you live on the Crescent? Drop me a line. I promise I won't steal the silver. The lines through the station are in a sort of double-decker formation, with the northbound line above the southbound. At platform level, the station is very typical of the Yerkes lines. Every station on the Bakerloo, as well as the also owned by Yerkes Piccadilly and Hampstead lines, had individual tile patterns to make them immediately distinguishable to their regular users. However, you may notice that one end of the platform is slightly plainer than the other. That came much later, in 1936. At this time, a number of the Bakerloo stations were extended to take eight-car trains, and Regent's Park was one of them. Another tell is that the platform is perfectly straight for most of its length, the better for avoiding the dreaded gap between the platform and the train, you know, the one that you have to mind, but then the platform slightly curves where it's been extended. The station was built with lifts, again like the other stations on the line. However, it was always one of the more minor stations, and so it wasn't considered economically worth it to rebuild it with escalators, once those started being installed in tube stations from 1911. This lack of an update almost led to the station's closure in 1983, when London Transport declared that replacing the original and now extremely old lifts just wasn't economically viable. It was only the intervention of the Greater London Council that kept the station open. The station these days is kept in very good nick and definitely retains its Edwardian Art Nouveau feel. However, it is, at the time of writing, the second least used station in Zone 1. Perhaps that's appropriate. After all, it wasn't even supposed to be there in the first place. Well, I hope you enjoyed this afterthought tale from the tube. If you did, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. If you'd like to know more, I recommend the Bakerloo Line by Mike Horn and the History of the Bakerloo Line by Clive D.W. Feather, which were my two main sources for this video. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your generous support. You are the parliamentary bill to my capital shortfall. And I'll see you all again very soon for another Tale from the Tube.